period of sessions. Our subject in this um, session is on the human rights situation of workers in the meat packing and poultry industry in the United States. We are delighted to have with us representatives from the state, very many of them, so I will ask them to introduce themselves. Uh, and also uh, petitioners, I see several as well, um, so we wouldn't read all them all out, especially since we are a bit behind already, so you will ask you to introduce yourselves at the time. And I have with me Commissioner Felipe Gonzalez, former president of the commission, and new commissioner, uh, Paolo Vanucci. Uh, we will be giving each uh, party 20 minutes to make their presentations, after which we will make uh, some contributions on our end, and then hopefully we'll have time to come back to you with some other observations. So let's start uh, with the petitioners. Thank you. My name is Tom Fridgey, and I'm a staff attorney for the Southern Poverty Law Center. Under Article 5 of the American Convention on Human Rights, every person has the right to have his physical, mental, and moral integrity respected. Yet every day, workers in the United States meatpacking and poultry industries face brutal working conditions. These industries violate the fundamental human rights of many workers who come from all over the hemisphere by systematically exploiting the lack of work speed safety regulations in the United States. The US in turn negligently permits these industries to inflict disabling harm on thousands of employees. The overwhelming majority of poultry processing and meat packing workers suffer severe and crippling injuries due to tendon, nerve, joint, and bone damage caused by dangerous working conditions. And the most pervasive injuries are caused by fast work speeds. The industry's massive disassembly lines can slaughter and process 400 head of cattle an hour or 10,000 chickens per hour, forcing workers to maintain high work speeds in cold conditions with slippery floors and dull knives. Workers perform between 20,000 and 100,000 cutting, grabbing, pulling, or hanging motions per shift this causes workers great pain in their hands, wrists, arms, and backs, but when they ask for a break to rest, use the restroom, or seek medical attention, they're usually sent right back to the same job they were working before without meaningful treatment or accommodation. And the speed is so unrelenting that it has forced workers to urinate or defecate in their clothing on the line because employers deny reasonable bathroom use, violating workers' rights to dignity. Other prevalent types of injuries workers suffer include lacerations, amputations of fingers or limbs, chemical burns, and skin infections, and even respiratory illnesses. Now, the United States Department of Agriculture has proposed a new regulation that would make these violations worse by permitting companies to operate poultry plant evisceration lines as fast as 175 birds per minute. The organizations petitioning the commission today, along with many other human rights groups and organized labor unions, have submitted comments to the USDA urging it to abandon this proposal and have informed the agency of the human rights violations in which it will be complicit. Nonetheless, it is projected to be finalized this April 2014. This exhaustion of our domestic avenues for relief is part of why we're here before the commission today, seeking assistance. The petitioners here today as part of a coalition of 15 civil rights and human rights groups have also formally asked the, the United States Occupational Safety and Health Administration as well as the USDA to promulgate safe, slower, enforceable work speed standards for meat and poultry processing plants, but we have yet to receive a response. The United States is failing to protect meatpacking and poultry processing workers from these rampant violations of human rights to safe and healthy workplaces. There is no enforceable work speed standard, and existing worker protections are inadequate to prevent the most pervasive injuries and human rights violations. Testifying before the Commission will be meatpacking worker Teresa Martinez, 
poultry processing worker Gwen Clements, Nebraska Appleseed attorney Omed Zabi, Liz Borkowski from the George Washington University Milken Institute School of Public Health, meatpacking worker Juan Martinez, and Lee Pearl Duff, who is the mother of deceased poultry processing worker Ronnie Duff. Our delegation also includes poultry processing worker Lashonda Babbitt of the Coalition of Poultry Workers, Rochelle Hammer of the Midwest Coalition for Human Rights and the University of Minnesota, Divya Prasad and April Hartsfield of the Southern Poverty Law Center, and Gloria Sarmiento and Becky Gould of Nebraska Appleseed. Thank you. Mi nombre es Teresa Martinez, originaria de México, pero he vivido en Nebraska por 13 años. Trabajé en una empacadora de carne por cuatro años y medio. Empaqué jamones ocho horas al día, de 40 a 50 jamones por minuto. La línea corre muy, muy fuerte y sin parar. Después de tres años, tuve una cirugía en mi hombro derecho. El dolor era tan fuerte que yo no podía ni levantar el hombro. En casa aún no puedo hacer las labores domésticas, tampoco puedo levantar a mis hijos con este hombro. La cirugía no funcionó. Después de dos años, me, debí, me despierto en la noche con tanto dolor. A veces quisiera que quitarme este hombro y que me pusiera nudo de plástico para no tener tanto dolor. La recuperación de la cirugía fue larga y difícil. Cuando regresé a trabajar, me asignaron el mismo trabajo de antes y la velocidad de la línea era igual o inclusive más fuerte, pero a los supervisores no les importaba, solo querían que yo hiciera el trabajo. Lo que yo quería era ser tratado como un ser humano y no como una máquina reemplazable. En mi área de trabajo, trabajábamos ocho personas. Había ocasiones en las que las ocho estábamos lastimadas. Le decíamos al supervisor, pero el supervisor no hacía nada y solo nos pedía más producción. Cuando yo era eficiente, quedaba el 100% de mí, me nominaron cuatro veces a empleada del mes. Cuando yo empecé a quejarme de mi dolor, me empezaron a cortar horas y me empezaron a mandar para la casa. Si nuevamente me invitaran a trabajar en una empacadora, yo diría que no, porque esas empacadoras están matando a la gente. La línea está corriendo muy, muy fuerte, la línea corre demasiado rápido. ¿Cómo se supone que yo voy a vivir con este dolor? Yo tengo sueños y tengo una familia y la velocidad de la línea terminó con ellos y terminará con los sueños de muchas familias si la velocidad de la línea no se regula. Gracias. Hi, good morning. My name is Gwen Clements. I work for Purdue Farms in um, poultry processing plant in Kentucky for over a year until I was fired in January of 2014. I started out on Thin Slice Line where I sliced chicken breast and packed them into trays. I was then transferred to the leg line where I packed chicken legs in layers. I was required to lay 40, uh, layer 47 pieces per minute. Sometimes the supervision timed us to make sure that we were working fast enough. They put a lot of pressure on us to keep up the fast pace of the plant. After performing the same repetitive motions day after day, I started to feel pain in my hands. The pain became unbearable after I switched to the leg line. It was so bad it kept me awake at night. I went to the company nurse and she told my supervisor to slow down the line and then gradually increase the speed. This is called ramping in. My supervisor did not comply with her request and I had to keep up the same fast pace despite the pain. I went to the nurse several more times. Each time she advised my supervisor to ramp me in and each time my supervisor ignored her request. According to the company policies, all new hires and workers transferring to new lines should be ramped in. But I never once <clears throat> saw a supervisor slow down the line for anyone. We are under too much pressure to meet the daily orders. 
the company does not follow its own policies. The medications, creams, and wrist splints that the nurse had given me did not help. The pain got so bad I was taken off the line for two weeks. When I returned, my supervisor again failed to slow down the line. I finally went to a neurologist and was diagnosed with early stages of carpal tunnel. The company disputed the diagnosis and put me back on the line. In addition to the excruciating hand pain, I also developed respiratory problems while working in the plant and fell ill with bronchitis on four occasions. I believe the bronchitis was triggered by the chemicals in the plant. Sometimes the chlorine fumes were so bad that I could smell and taste them um, after work on, as I was going home. The next day, I wouldn't be able to breathe. After more than a year at Purdue, I was fired at the beginning of January. I believe I was fired for complaining to the company about my work-related problems, health problems. Unfortunately, my story is not unique. Many of my coworkers also suffer from dangerously fast work speeds. Some still are there suffering in silence, afraid of being fired. And some were fired when their injuries got worse and they spoke up. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Omaid Zabi, and I'm a staff attorney with Nebraska Appleseed. I'll be talking a little bit about the underreporting of injuries and the work conditions and plants. The underreporting of injuries is a systemic problem in meat and poultry plants across the country. Government reported injury rates in meat and poultry plants exceed rates in private industry. Poultry plants, according to government data, um, have about a 5.8% rate of injury while meatpacking plants have a 7.8% rate of injury which exceeds the three, a little over 3% rate of injury in all of private industry. However, medical studies, government reports, and extensive surveys of workers demonstrate that the frequency and number of all injuries sustained in meat and poultry plants significantly exceed these government statistics. For instance, Nebraska apple seeds 2009 report, which surveyed 455 workers in Nebraska, found that 62% had injuries in the previous year. And the Southern Poverty Law Center's 2013 report, which surveyed over 300 poultry workers in the South, 72% had described sustaining an injury while working in a plant. Moreover, meatpacking and poultry workers must endure unsafe and abusive work conditions, which are prevalent in this industry. Harsh and dangerous conditions include, some of which uh, Mr. Fritchie referenced to, verbal abuse, sexual harassment, inadequate bathroom access, such that workers are forced to urinate and defecate while working on the line, the lack of adequate personal protective and safety equipment, substandard to non-existent medical care, minimal training, slippery floors, and safety incentive programs that in reality operate to discourage workers from reporting injuries and from drawing attention to unsafe conditions. Furthermore, the human rights of these workers are violated, uh, are violated by the poultry and meat industry, and they also include Article 14 of the, of the American Declaration of the Rights and Duties of Man, which states that all persons have the right to work <laughs> under proper conditions. Articles 34G and 45B of the OAS Charter which requires member states to, to devote their utmost efforts to ensure that fair wages and acceptable working condition or acceptable working opportunities for all and to ensure life, health, and a decent standard of living for all workers and their families. And under the Velasquez Rodriguez Doctrine and the Rugby Framework, under which the U.S. Has a, has a duty to prevent, investigate, and punish violations of fundamental human rights. And again, as you hear the workers talk today, we are talking about thousands and thousands of workers who sustain permanently disabling injuries who are forced to work like machines. They perform tens of thousands of, of repetitive motions every work shift. This is a public health crisis where thousands 
of injured workers sustained permanent pain, nerve, tendon, and bone damage, crippling injuries that prevent normal movement and grip in their hands and backs. And in the face of decades of research and data, the U.S. has unfortunately failed to put in place sufficient work speed protections to stop these injuries in meat and poultry plants. Good morning. My name is Liz Borkowski, and I'm a researcher in the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health at the George Washington University's Milken Institute School of Public Health. I want to emphasize to the Commission that the personal stories you are hearing from workers today are not isolated incidents, but examples of the kinds of widespread health problems that researchers have found in U.S. meat and poultry workers for decades. In the interest of time, I will mention just a few examples of peer-reviewed and government research findings. A study by Wake Forest School of Medicine researchers found that 59% of poultry workers had evidence of carpal tunnel syndrome. A study by Duke University Medical Center researchers found the prevalence of musculoskeletal symptoms among women poultry workers to be 2.4 times higher than among a comparable group of women workers. And a health hazard evaluation conducted at a poultry plant by the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health found that 42% of workers had medical evidence of carpal tunnel syndrome. Conditions such as carpal tunnel syndrome and lower back pain can cause a lifetime of severe pain and disability. Slowing the line speeds in meat and poultry plants would improve workers' chances to live healthy lives. Thank you. Buenos días, mi nombre es Juan Martínez, soy originario de México. He trabajado en empacadoras de carne cerca de ocho años. Uh, durante estos ocho años tuve cuatro cirugías, dos en mis manos, dos en mi espalda. Uh, el principal problema fue el problema de mis manos uh, debido al movimiento, movimiento repetitivo. Eso me causó el síndrome del carpotano, de ahí vinieron dos cirugías. Después vino mi lastimadura de, de mi columna vertebral, dos cirugías más. Consecuencias de todo esto, uh, perdí la fuerza en mis manos, eh, no, no puedo apuñar bien mis, mis, mis manos, uh, la fuerza de mis piernas. Esto me llevó a que se me deshabilitara a la edad de 41 años, fui deshabilitado. Imagínense ustedes el dolor que se siente cuando una persona que ha sido 100% productiva a este país, al, al trabajo, uh, cómo se siente uno, uh, un, se siente uno miserable, de, de una basura, cuando la compañía te desecha. ¿Por qué? Porque ya te explotaron al 100%. Después de, de que esa persona es, uh, deshabilita es, es uh, diagnosticada que va a tener restricciones de por vida, La compañía ya no los quiere, no los quiere uh, que sigan trabajando en la compañía. Estas personas son despedidas del trabajo. Es muy difícil que esa persona se vuelva a reintegrar a un trabajo normal. Nadie quiere contratar personas que están uh, con deshabilidades, que tienen restricciones médicas de por vida. Uh, después de trabajar en empacadoras, <coughs> los, los, los lesionados... Tienen que batallar mucho en el diario vivir. Muchas, eh, conozco muchas personas y en mi caso personal perdí, perdí parte de mi familia porque tuve que parar de trabajar. Por eso hago, hago una petición encarecidamente al gobierno federal porque el nombre, el nombre de mis compañeros que aún están trabajando en las empacadoras, les pido encarecidamente que haga una regulación Para la, para la línea, puesto que eso está acabando con la salud de los trabajadores. Muchas gracias. My name is Lee Pearl Duff. And I would like to thank the commission for considering this important matter of human rights violations of workers in the poultry plants in the United States. I am here on behalf of my son, Ronnie Lee Duff Sr. Ronnie was killed on September the 9th, 2012, while working at the Southern Hens Chicken Processing Plant in Moselle, Mississippi. 
He was pulled into an unguarded screw auger with no emergency shut off equipment accessible to his coworkers who were present. His left side was completely gone. The leg from the hip and the right side was completely crushed. If they could have shut the machine off, I might have a son without any legs. But since they couldn't shut it off, I don't have a son. When Osher investigated the plant after his death, it found 43 safety violations and health violations, 37 of them were serious. My son and his co-workers were forced to work in an unsafe poultry plant and it cost him his life. It appears that poultry manufacturers within the state of Mississippi do not have or enforce safeguards for human life, but enforce all kinds of rules about the humane treatment for the birds that these workers process. On that day, not one worker could help my son because they did not have the knowledge to institute an emergency shutdown. I believe that everyone working with or around machinery that can cause death, take a limb, or inflict serious injury must be able to stop it. Run is deaf represent the worst case outcome when the poultry and meat processing industries are left largely unregulated. Tragically, run is, is not a unique case. No family should suffer the anguish that is now in my heart over the preventable loss of my son. He was a good man, just trying to take care of his family and build a life. He was only 39 years old, and he leaves behind three children of his own. Now his life is gone because someone didn't consider him enough important enough as a bird. Since my son's tragic death, it has been my number one goal to do everything possible within my power to prevent this devastating and senseless loss from happening to another family. In the moment that my son was caught up in the machine, he knew in an instance that his life, that he was going to die and he endured a torturous death. The mental picture of my son's last moments on this earth will haunt me until I go to my own grave. The condition in these plants for years has caused injuries to thousands of workers. So I come to you today with a heavy heart asking that you consider my request, along with the others that are being made on behalf of thousands of workers and have been injured, who have been injured in the poultry industry. I also have brought today the news relief and release and the autopsy report of my son's death. Any aid you can provide me with to ensure that good comes from my son's untimely and tragic death would be eternally appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I did allow the last speaker a little extra time, but I'm sure you, the state, would understand if I don't give you extra time. So I will still give you, because this was done only out of respect, so I will still give you 20 minutes to make your presentation. Yes. Okay. That, that's fine, Madam Chair. Distinguished commissioners, petitioners, secretary, colleagues, my name is Lawrence Combiner. I am the Deputy Permanent Representative to the United States Mission to the Organization of American States. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here today on behalf of my government. I would like to begin by saying that the United States is committed to these issues and welcomes the opportunity to discuss the policies and practices in place to protect individuals who work in the poultry 
and meatpacking industry. Before I turn it over to our technical experts, the United States wishes to make clarification to one particular matter raised by petitioners. Specifically, in reference to any pending rulemaking and or petitions related to pending rulemaking by U.S. government agencies, the United States unfortunately cannot discuss these matters due to the ongoing deliberative nature of the regulatory process. We hope that the Commission and petitioners understand this particular limitation. With that clarification, I would like to introduce our experts from the Departments of Labor and Agriculture. Uh, to my immediate left is Mr. Andrew Levinson with the Department of Labor's Occupational Safety and Health Administration of OSHA. To his left is Mr. Art Buchanan, also of OSHA. Then we have Ms. Rachel Edelstein, Assistant Administrator, Office of Policy and Program Development, Food Safety and Inspection Service at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, as well as Ms. Mary Peretta of USDA, and finally Ms. Rachel Owen of the staff of U.S. Mission to the Organization of American States. Uh, I would now turn it over to Mr. Levinson, and following Mr. Levinson, Ms. Edelstein will have some remarks and all of our technical experts are available to respond to questions from the commissioners. Thank you very much. Thank you very much I, uh, for inviting me to testify today. I am Andrew Levinson, Deputy Director of OSHA's Directorate of Standards and Guidance. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration was created in 1971 by the Occupational Safety and Health Act. In our 43 years since OSHA was established, our nation has made dramatic progress in reducing work-related deaths and injuries. Since 1970, workplace fatalities have been reduced by more than 65 percent and occupational injuries and illnesses by over 67 percent. But far too many preventable fatalities, injuries, and illnesses continue to occur. Preliminary reports from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics show that nearly 4,400 workers were killed on the job in 2012 or approximately 12 workers every day. Private sector employers reported nearly 3 million workers suffered work-related injuries or illnesses last year. Congress created OSHA to improve safety and health working conditions <coughs> for working men and women by setting and enforcing standards and providing training, outreach, education, and compliance assistance. Under the U.S. OSHA law, employers are responsible for providing a safe workplace. OSHA, however, is a small agency. Federal OSHA, along with its state partners, has approximately 2,200 inspectors to cover approximately 7 to 8 million work sites in the U.S. It has been estimated that it would take OSHA over 100 years to inspect every workplace under its authority and jurisdiction. OSHA must thereby focus its resources, such as enforcement, on the most dangerous injury, uh, industries and jobs in America. Meatpacking and poultry workers, as you have heard today, face many serious hazards, including high noise levels, dangerous equipment, musculoskeletal disorders, and hazardous chemicals such as ammonia used in refrigeration. Meatpacking, in fact, is among the 25 industries in the nation with the highest rates of serious occupational injuries and illnesses. Musculoskeletal disorders are of particular concern and continue to be common among workers in the meatpacking and poultry processing industries. In fact, the incidence rate of occupational illness cases, including musculoskeletal disorders, in the poultry industry in 2011 and 2012 has remained high, at more than five times the average for all U.S. industries. Poultry industry employers also frequently identify repetitive motion injuries more frequently than employers in general, three times more frequently in 2012 and almost six times more frequently in 2011. A recent investigation by the United States National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health found a very high prevalence, more than 40%, of carpal tunnel syndrome among, among workers at one poultry processing plant and made several recommendations to reduce exposures. Similarly, workers in the meatpacking industry experience <coughs> elevated rates of occupational injuries and illnesses. In 2012, the incidents of injuries and illnesses involving days away from work or restricted work activity in the meatpacking industry was more than three times the private sector average. The incidence of cases resulting from repetitive motion involving microtasks was almost ten times the private sector average. 
To focus enforcement resources on meatpacking and poultry industries, OSHA has launched special emphasis enforcement programs that allow OSHA to inspect industries with particular hazards. Meatpacking and poultry processing, for example, are included in our uh, national emphasis program to prevent amputations, where we inspect workplaces with amputation hazards, as well as our site-specific targeting program, where we inspect workplaces with the highest rates of injury and illness. In addition, OSHA is very concerned about meatpacking and poultry workers suffering injuries and illnesses when ammonia leaks from plant refrigeration systems. In the Midwest and other areas of the country, OSHA is partnering with EPA to help protect workers from dangerous and preventable leaks of anhydrous ammonia. In addition to our targeted investigations, under the OSHA law, workers and their representatives may also file a complaint. The complaint forms are on OSHA's website or workers can call our 1-800 number. OSHA is here to help and all of the information that is provided is kept confidential. The petitioners here today have requested that OSHA consider developing a specific regulation on line speed for meat packing and poultry operations. As we explained in recent meetings with some of the petitioners, musculoskeletal disorders in meat packing and poultry workers are caused by a number of factors. The amount of repetitions of the job, the force used to do the job, such as how hard a worker has to grip his or her knife or scissors, workers' postures, since awkward postures such as bending the wrist or reaching above the shoulder can contribute to musculoskeletal disorders and vibration. In addition, cold temperatures in these plants can combine with the other ergonomic risk factors to increase the potential for developing musculoskeletal disorders. Thus, any effort to prevent musculoskeletal disorders in meat packing and poultry operations must take all of these factors into account, not just line speed. Although OSHA does not have a specific standard governing line speed on poultry or meat packing repetitive motion hazards, employers still have an obligation to provide a workplace free from recognized hazards under the general duty clause, section 5A1. OSHA cites ergonomic hazards under the general duty clause and issues ergonomic citations and hazard letters as part of its overall enforcement program. OSHA encourages employers to implement effective programs and take other measures to reduce ergonomic hazards and associated musculoskeletal disorders. A great deal of information is currently available from OSHA, NIOSH, and various industry and labor organizations on how to implement effective ergonomics programs, and OSHA urges employers to avail themselves of these resources. Furthermore, OSHA has developed specific industry guidelines to assist employers in reducing musculoskeletal disorders. We've recently updated our, and republished our guidelines on preventing <coughs> musculoskeletal disorders in poultry processing plants, and I've brought copies of those, that document here today. We also are in the process of translating the publication into Spanish, uh, and, and the document provides low-cost suggestions on simple ways that employers can adjust their lines and operations to keep workers healthy. In addition to these enforcement and guidance efforts to protect meat packing and poultry workers, four years ago, OSHA launched a special outreach initiative to reach vulnerable workers with important information about their rights under the OSHA law. Vulnerable workers include those with high-risk jobs and maybe immigrant workers or others with limited English proficiency. Because of language barriers, literacy, and other limitations, these workers are often hard for us to reach through traditional communications methods. They often do not get the necessary safety training on the job, and they often do not know their rights under the OSHA law. Following our groundbreaking OSHA National Action Summit for Latino Worker Health and Safety in 2010, OSHA's 10 regions implemented outreach strategies to create partnerships and alliances with Latin American consulates, neighborhood faith-based, and other nonprofit organizations in each of our 10 regions. These groups provide vulnerable workers, including meat packing and poultry workers, with critical information about workplace hazards and their rights under the law. OSHA has also translated hundreds of publications into Spanish and produced new low literacy educational materials aimed at protecting vulnerable workers. We have also created a Spanish language webpage. OSHA has bilingual staff in almost all of its 90 area offices. Over the past four years, OSHA has awarded Susan Hardwood training grants to not-for-profit organizations to provide education and training to workers and employers in high-risk injuries, including community organizations and labor unions that work in the meatpacking and poultry industry. 
In addition, the Department of Labor has been actively engaged in OAS's Inter-American Conference of Ministers of Labor, which provides a forum for ministers and secretaries of labor throughout the hemisphere to work together and exchange information on best practices on occupational safety and health. I want to thank you for inviting OSHA to present at this hearing. OSHA is working hard to protect workers in the most dangerous industries, and I'll be glad to answer questions. Hello. Oh. Hello. I am Rachel Edelstein, the Assistant Administrator for the Office of Policy and Program Development in the Food Safety and Inspection Service. As you have just heard, Congress created OSHA to improve the safety and health of workers. FSIS has a much different role. The Food Safety and Inspection Service is the public health agency in the United States, Department of Agriculture, USDA, responsible for ensuring that the nation's commercial supply of meat, poultry, and egg products is safe, wholesome, and correctly labeled and packaged. FSIS's core mission and statutory obligation is to protect public health. To do so, FSIS is in every plant where livestock and poultry are slaughtered, examining every carcass for food safety defects and the conditions in the plant to make sure that they will not result in product contamination. In addition, FSIS inspection personnel visit every meat and poultry processing plant at least once per shift. The statute under which FSIS inspects poultry, the Poultry Products Inspection Act, was passed in 1957. Significantly, FSIS has inspected poultry slaughter in the same way since the statute was passed. We are considering modernizing how we do inspection to respond to the food safety challenges we now face. Thus, in January 2012, FSIS published a proposed rule to modernize poultry slaughter inspection to advance the agency's public health mission. Under the rulemaking system in the United States, after a proposed rule is published, there is an opportunity for public comment. The agency then considers the comments and decides whether to publish a final rule. FSIS is considering modernizing its poultry inspection system because under the current poultry inspection system, FSIS online inspectors perform quality assurance and other activities that have little to do with food safety such as looking for bruises and feathers and directing plant employees to remove these defects. Dangerous microbial pathogens responsible for causing foodborne illnesses cannot be detected by visually inspecting carcasses. We need our inspectors to be focused on a single purpose, to protect public health through food safety. Thus, FSIS has proposed to turn quality control activities over to the plant so that FSIS can focus its inspection on areas of poultry production that will have the biggest impact on public health. Instead of focusing on visible defects that do not present a risk to food safety, the proposed inspection system will allow FSIS inspectors to focus on critical food safety tasks, such as verifying that plants are maintaining sanitary conditions and controlling for hazards at critical points in the production process. FSIS proposed these changes based on data that it collected as part of a pilot program that started in 1999 to evaluate the core activities of inspection personnel. In developing the proposal, FSIS conducted a risk assessment that estimated the increase, that increasing the number of inspection activities that are focused on ensuring food safety will prevent approximately 5,000 foodborne illnesses per year. This is important because for the past 10 years, the food safety community in the United States has had little success in reducing the rates of illness from two pathogens commonly found in poultry, Salmonella and Campylobacter. Together, these two bacteria cause an approximate 344,000 poultry-associated foodborne illnesses in the United States every year. And the rates of illness caused by these two foodborne pathogens have been stagnant, even showing occasional rises in recent years. The data that FSIS has collected in the plants that are part of the pilot have shown a reduction in salmonella after plants converted to the new inspection system. Based on our review of these data and studies, we are confident that if implemented, the proposed new inspection system will improve food safety. We are aware that in the course of our rulemaking, some, concerns, some have raised concerns that the changes in the way that plants will operate under the new inspection 
could adversely affect safety of workers in the plants. As, as a food safety agency, FSIS does not have the legal authority or expertise to regulate worker safety. However, USD, USDA would never put forward a rule that would put anyone in harm's way. This is not a choice between food safety and worker safety. As we evaluate the next steps for this rulemaking, we are working closely with our federal partners at the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, and the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, NIOSH, on important efforts to strengthen the federal government's data collection and enforcement in this area. These two federal agencies have the, the regulatory authority and, and expertise to improve worker safety. As part of its modernization effort, FSIS asked, asked NIOSH to conduct a study to assess the impact that at least one of the changes that FSIS proposed, that is, allowing the line, line speed to increase, would have on plant workers. As a result, as OSHA mentioned in its sta statement, NIOSH conducted a, a health hazard evaluation at one plant that increased the line speed of its, it, it, of its evisceration line. NIOSH looked at whether an increase in musculoskeletal and upper extremities trauma would result. NIOSH began its evaluation in August 2012 and issued its final report on March 20th, 20, 2014. NIOSH says that it found no link between increased line speeds and worker safety in this plant. The study found that overall injury rates and working conditions remain the same following a line speed increase like those that would be allowed under the modernization proposal. NIOSH's report also found, however, that musculoskeletal problems are a real concern for poultry workers and makes a number of recommendations for improving worker safety but it does not provide evidence that increased line speeds are a significant safety factor. FSIS has called on the poultry industry leaders to take steps to improve worker safety in poultry plants while we continue to examine the proposals to make America's food safer. safer. FSIS will continue to collabor collaborate with OSHA to address worker health and safety issues as we move forward with our efforts to modernize poultry inspection. Thank you again for inviting FSIS to present at this hearing. I will be glad to answer your questions. Uh, thank you very much uh, to both you both. I'm now going to invite uh, the Commissioner Gonzalez, who is not only the Rapporteur for the United States, but also the Rapporteur for the Rights of Migrant Workers. Uh, so I think this would be of significant interest, particularly in relation to access to justice issues, given what we've heard. So Commissioner Gonzalez. Thank you very much. Good morning to the petitioners and again to the U.S. Uh, Corman delegation. Um, I would like to make a few questions. Uh, the first one I would like to post to the petitioners um, concerning uh, uh, to what extent the um, unions uh, represent uh, uh, workers are at these plants and uh, to what extent uh, you have a freedom to associate in unions and uh, as a legal general matter, and also as a practical matter, where these unions exist and what the power really they really do have or don't. Um, I would also like to ask um, both to both parties uh, how this uh, uh, situation, uh, which has been recognized by both uh, the petitioners and the government, uh, that is a serious one, uh, how this uh, affect to migrants. Um, who I understand are a significant uh, part of the um, workers at these plants. And uh, finally, I would like to, um, to ask the um, petitioners, what would you suggest uh, to the government to improve the inspection system that is uh, uh, been in, in, a, in a reform as the U.S. government stated? Thanks. Uh, thank you. Um, as some of you know, in the 2012 December, we 
it created a new unit on economic, social, and cultural rights, which was ready to promote the justiceability of these rights in accordance with the San Salvador Protocol and generally to develop the jurisprudence in this area. Um, and currently, the head of this unit is our new commissioner, uh, Commissioner Vanucci. So I'm going to ask him to make a contribution on this issue. Gracias. <clears throat> Gracias por las informaciones importantes, las explicaciones del Estado. Eh, la primera pregunta, Felipe ya hizo, que es eh, cuanto a la participación de los sindicatos de trabajadores, que yo le he mencionado solo la coalición de sindicalistas negros y los sindicatos específicos de este ramo, si están participando en estas denuncias, en este trabajo, en esta lucha. Uh, manifestar eh, mi interés inicial por la idea, la sugestión, la sugerencia de, de una posible visita a una planta, porque como nuevo responsable por la unidad temática de los derechos económicos, sociales y culturales, Estamos planeando hacer una segunda consulta regional en abril en Bogotá. La primera uh, se pasó en Buenos Aires cuando era responsable la comisionada Rosmarie Antoine. E, posiblemente una tercera en México y una cuarta en Estados Unidos, posiblemente aquí en Washington. Eh, yo fui eh, procurado por algunos importantes sindicatos de Estados Unidos, eh, CEU, eh, Service Employees, and eh, UAW, United Auto Workers, eh, con la idea también de visitar plantas de Nissan, eh, Volkswagen en Tennessee, Mississippi. E mis otras preguntas son si en esta movilización eh, los peticionarios están llevando también la cuestión a la Organización Internacional del Trabajo, a, a la Organización uh, Mundial de Salud de las Naciones Unidas o al organismo de la región, la OPAS, Organización Panamericana de Salud, y como hicieron uh, mención al, uh, al trabajo de John Ruggie, eh, si también eh, las empresas eh, que participan del Pacto Global eh, están conscientes y ya fueron informadas de lo que se pasa. Gracias. I'm now going to invite our Executive Secretary, um, Mr. Emilio Alvarez, to ask a question. Thank you very much to the states and the petitioners, especially to the petitioners. You've been asking this hearing for three times, and I I'm glad that you insist because this is a very important matter. Uh, it's very important in the agenda and the United States human rights. Of course, I am glad to the state that you present us a wide aspect about monitoring and evaluation of these matters. But I would like, to, if you have a specific questions regarding answering the last testimony, what are you doing? How can you answer that particular one? And if you have some examples answering also the testimonies that we're here, we, we hear just today, because it looks like it is not enough what you are doing. If, if there are some particular answers, what you hear today. Uh, thank you. Um, I would just like to add one thing, and that is in relation to um, the, the. Of course, the state has conceded it's a it's an important issue and a troublesome issue, and, and it's also acknowledged difficulty in supervising um, plants and factories and so on. So I just wondered whether the idea of safety committees has caught on the United States generally, and if this is an option, not necessarily as part of a union-based um, committee, but this is something the ILO 
has uh, pushed, promoted for a long time, and it can provide a, a second tier of protection. So I just want, wanted to throw that out there. Thank you. Um, I'm going to, uh, we're going to give each of you five, well, four and a half to be precise, minutes to respond uh, so that we can get back on time. So we can put petitioners, you can have another few minutes. Thank you for your questions. Um, I will take a couple of, I'll try to answer a couple of questions and then um, if other panelists, I, I know Tom Fritchie will also try to answer some of the more legal and, and policy questions. Um, and if any of the workers would like to contribute, um, please feel free. Um, in reference to the migrant worker issue, uh, we see a lot of um, work pressures that are specifically associated with with workers who are immigrants, particularly those who are undocumented immigrants. Um, there's already a, a fear of retaliation in plants for workers if they have to report an injury. Uh, Appleseed, Southern Poverty Law Center, uh, Midwest Coalition of, for Human Rights, and uh, Human Rights Watch have all done reports in the last 10 years which have shown a majority of workers um, fear reporting injuries um, for fear of, of being fired or um, you know, we've seen workers who have had their wages stolen, or, or have, or have asked for a, a lighter work duty and have failed to, been accommodated to those. Um, but with uh, immigrants specifically, too, and with those who are undocumented, there is an even more heightened fear of being fired because they feel like they don't have any protection from from being fired, especially in if they work in states in which the employer does not have to provide a reason for firing the, uh, the worker um, himself or herself. Um, and so you see these extra pressures from undocumented workers and employers exploit some of those work pressures um, to force workers to work at these extreme uh, speeds, speeds of work. And, and once a worker gets injured, uh, an employer is free to fire them without any, any consequence or to, you know, um, create work conditions that we've described before with the verbal abuse, sexual harassment, you know, lack of bathroom breaks and, and everything else. Um, and also in terms of how we would suggest that we would uh, want to improve the system, I think we've outlined some of those reasons in, in the rulemaking petition that we submitted to OSHA and the USDA, but I think our biggest ask is that we would ask uh, that there be a work speed standard um, created uh, to to lower the speed of the lines, but to also take into account the a number of repetitive motions that workers make and also to um, ensure that there are a sufficient number of workers for each uh, work position. Thank you very much. Oh, okay, I can give you 30 seconds. <laughs> oh, thank you. And just to add finally um, that uh, we would certainly welcome a standard along the lines Mr. Levinson uh, sort of mentioned that that we recognize that speed is not the only factor, but we'd welcome a standard that also protects workers from hazards from force, vibration, and the other factors contributing to musculoskeletal injuries. Those aren't the only, that's not a reason not to issue the standard. And certainly, we think that would be an essential tool for when OSHA does go into a plant to protect workers. Currently, if it goes into a plant, there's little that it can do when it finds those hazards. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you. Um, since we've got a very short time, I'm going to speak very quickly. The first part is that um, we are aware of the impact of this issue on migrants. That's one of the reasons that OSHA has translated so many materials into Spanish. We make it clear on our uh, materials that we any information that is submitted is confidential, and we do not consider immigration status, and we do not report any of that information to any of the immigration officials whatsoever. We've also taken great steps to initiate these uh, partnerships with consulates throughout the nation, and we currently have partnerships with Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador, the Dominican Republic, and Philippines in all 10 of our regions. Um, in terms of rulemaking efforts, when OSHA passes a regulation, it typically takes seven years to write a regulation. More controversial ones often take longer. Um, we have a tremendous evidentiary burden and doing all of the supporting analysis to meet that requirement 
takes a lot of time and the agency has to have confidence that it can meet all of those burdens before it really even enters into rulemaking activities. Um, your specific question on safety committees, we are currently working on an injury and illness prevention program standard where safety committees and worker participation is a crucial part of that overall safety management program. So yes, we take your point, that's something we've been promoting, um, but again, rulemaking activities are very, very long uh, in the United States. Hi, um, FSIS has an employee safety, wellness, and uh, health and wellness staff. Um, and um, that staff is dedicated to ensuring a safe and helpful work environment for all agency employees that would, inc that would include any migrant employees. And their objective is to prevent accidents and injuries by providing technical assistance and training, assessing trends and performing in, um, inspection and reviews to evaluate um, the effectiveness of safety programs. Um, they also, their objective is to prevent and reduce occupational illnesses by assessing workplace exposure for inspection operations and new microbial reduction technologies. And also to provide um, industrial hygiene services for assistance on chemical, physical, and biological health hazards. Also, FSIS has established um, policies and guidelines for inspectors for reporting unsafe and unhealthful conditions. Um, we have directives that provide um, inspectors with the procedures for reporting and correcting work, workplace safety and health hazards that, um, that affect FSIS em employees. We also have developed a training course um, that's available online so that um, to improve FSIS employees' ability to recognize and report workplace safety and health hazards in accordance with the um, instructions. Um, and then as far as the rulemaking, a lot of the issues, we did get numerous comments on um, worker safety. And in developing the final rule, um, we've, evalu we've been evaluating all of those comments. And should the, world, should the rule go final, it would respond to um, and address all of those, those comments. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I would like to thank both parties uh, for coming here today, the petitioners for coming and highlighting this very important issue which is of significant interest to us and the state uh, for coming to engage with us and in particular for the spirit of cooperation and acknowledging that there is an issue that we are all ready to work towards. The commission would continue to monitor the situation. We would invite uh, some written information including answers to the questions that the executive Secretary posed about a specific um, the testimonies, particularly the last um, testimony that we heard from the petition. If you have specific information on that, we would very much welcome that as part of our monitoring exercise. So thank you, everyone.